Hi friends, it's Monica and let's review Swordcatcher by Cassandra Clare. This book has been on my radar ever since I found out that Cassandra Clare was going to be writing her first adult fantasy book and I was very curious to see how her writing would be that's not a Shadows Hunters book. Swordcatcher is book one in what I believe will be a trilogy and it is an adult high fantasy series. A quick summary about Swordcatcher is that we are set in the kingdom of Calestaline where the rich and criminals have one thing in common is their pursuit for power and wealth. There are two dual points of views in this book. First up, we have Cal, who was an orphan, but then he was stolen from his orphanage by the royal palace in order to become the sword catcher, which is essentially a body double for the prince, Connor. Then we have Lynn, who has magical abilities. She's a physician, and she's on a quest to save her best friend, Miriam. After an assassination attempt, Lynn and Cal are thrown together, and they are traversing through the criminal underbelly of Calestaline together. At first, it is a little bit slow going. I would say it is a slow burn for the world building. Especially in a new fantasy series, there are a lot of unfamiliar terms, cities, kingdoms, and characters. So it's a lot to keep in mind while you're trying to understand what's going on in the plot. Personally, I didn't really mind this because I really like Cassandra Clare's writing from Shadowhunters and after some time, you get used to the unfamiliar terms. All in all, this book really did grab my attention similar to how Shadowhunters did. The world itself is full of tense politics, magical lore, and competing forces in the kingdom. This world has actually lost its use of magic and only a really small specific community known as the Ashkari can perform magic through magical talismans and amulets. Diving into like the structure of the city and who runs the city, we have 12 charter families who are the nobility. And here is where it got a little bit confusing for me. Each charter family has their own trade and sector that they're specialized in. And it was hard to keep up of like who does what and who's who. I would always stand by this point that every fantasy book should have a little guide to help you understand the important terms and like characters. I think it's just really helpful in any fantasy book. The characters in this book are three-dimensional, they do not fall flat, they all have their own worries, fears, desires, ambitions, and values, and you really get to know each one. However, it did take me some time to be really invested in the characters' stories, but as soon as it got past like I think the 30% mark, that's when I started to get very invested into each character. With the dual point of view, we do have some characters that are showing up on the opposite sides of the power hierarchy. First, we have Cal with his Prince Connor, and they both live in the royal palace on the hill, and the hill is where all the noble families live. The hill is very divided from the city proper, and it's like a clear power imbalance there or class divide. Then we have Lynn and Miriam who live in the Salt. The Salt is like an enclosed community within Calestaline. Here they are Ashkari. According to the author, the Ashkari are inspired by Jewish mythology so we might see some similarities there. And with the Ashkari, there are very strict rules placed on them like they have a curfew. It was nice to see the contrast between how each character experiences the world and how their perspective may come from because of where they are. First up for more in depth in the characters is Kalyan or Kel. Kel is our body double for Prince Connor and he's the sword catcher. Kel, he really does step into Connor's place whenever there's a hint of danger around. Kel has truly like learned all aspects of Connor like his personality, his little preferences, his behavior and mannerisms. It felt like Cal is an extension of Connor more than he is himself as a person. And it seems like Cal does consider Connor first in his mind, but then as we get on through the book, that does change. Cal, he does have his own goals in mind. He does want to have a relationship and explore new avenues. But I do think that Cal has so much love and loyalty to Connor. And a weird thing that stuck out to me was that Cal 
doesn't have his own room in the palace. He stays in Connor's room and has a bed next to him. And it just kind of seemed to me that the king and queen doesn't really see Kel as a person, but as an asset to protect Connor as his bodyguard. I do hope that Cal will find his way to have more freedom but also keep with his values and with his friendship with Connor but sometimes I do feel like Connor can be a little bit short-sighted in how much Cal does for him. <laughs> Anyways moving on to our next character which is Lynn. Lynn is a Nashkar physician and she is on a desperate quest to find something, a remedy, to help save her dying best friend, Miriam. We follow Lynn while she goes throughout the city and treating her patients, and we see how people react to her being an Ashkari, and how people may just look at her weird or just notice her. And then through Lynn's grandfather, who actually serves the king, Lynn is thrust into the world of the nobility and things get really muddled from there on. I really liked Lynn. She is very blunt. She doesn't really mince her words. She says what she means and that really rubs some people the wrong way. And with Lynn, I do see her determination coming through with trying to save her best friend. Overall, I do hope Lynn can find some more peace in the next book, but I think things are just getting started for her. <laughs> then moving on to the romance aspect of this book. The romance in this book is not the focal point. I think that didn't really detract from the book for me. The romance is well taken care of and it is a slow burn. For one pairing, there is the enemies to lovers trope and with these two, they really do have a strong dislike for each other. It's such a nice slow burn. There's nice tension growing between them and a lot of uncertainty. But you know how you say like hate is kind of like the same level of passion that love is? It's kind of like that and it was nice to see that relationship evolve. There are some brothel scenes that we see and those scenes are not too spicy but they're very suggestive. However, I do suspect that there will be a large romance aspect in book two but in this first book, there's just a lot of introduction to the world and to the characters and to the plot lines so I think the romance will build up more in the sequel. Finally, I ended up rating Swordcatcher 4 out of 5 stars. I really did enjoy this book. Swordcatcher has it all, has such intense political intrigue as well as religious factors in there. There is a gradual buildup for when our two main characters collide, Lin and Kel, and when they do, they are involved in many different plans that they don't know that's ongoing. And these plans involve characters such as the king of Calestaline, the rock picker king who is the criminal underworld leader, as well as a lot of neighboring kingdoms. They also play a part in the political scheme. There is a nice build up to the end which does result in explosive action scenes and a lot of setup for book two. I really did enjoy my time reading Swordcatcher. There's a lot of colorful descriptions, a rich world, and memorable characters that you will love. And this is the end of my spoiler free review section because I'm going to be saying some spoilery predictions in the next section. So if you have not yet read Swordcatcher, please leave the video now so you don't get spoiled. And this is your last warning. On to the predictions now. So for my first prediction, I wanted to talk about Kel joining the Rag Picker King. We do see maybe on the last page of the book that Kel is going to be working with the Rag Picker King, but with still Connor's protection in mind. My prediction is that Kel will detach from Connor a little bit and kind of go with his own plans. I don't know what those kind of plans would be because Kel is very Connor oriented and I am interested to see what kind of ambitions or hopes and dreams that Kel has. Also the relationship between Kel and Connor, they don't really strike me as such close brothers because Connor doesn't seem to acknowledge that Kel 
does so much for him. Kel kind of just goes along with whatever Connor wants to do. And even though Kel may not want to, he just goes along because he has to. It's like his duty. <laughs> but moving on to my next prediction is about Joyce, is Lin's older brother who is absent throughout book one. But I think he will pop up in book two and he will have some something to say to Lin about her magical powers. And maybe that Joyce will have found a magical secret on his journeys around the kingdom and the world that will conveniently help Lin out. My last little prediction is about a romance and of course I'm going to be talking about Lin and Connor. I do think they will end up together but it will not be an easy journey for them because Lin she does really have a lot of apprehension with Connor and Connor with Lin. I really did like their little hate to love arc. Um, Connor, I think he has a lot of maturing still left to do because he's not used to having anyone say no to him. He has so many yes people around him. So I think Connor needs to do some growth in that area. Also with their positions, they're obviously really the opposite spectrum of Lin being an Ashkari. And then we have Connor who's the heir and the prince to the throne. But let's see how that will play out for these two. Anyways, those were all my predictions and if you made it this far, I hope you really enjoyed my review. I hope you all had a wonderful day and don't forget to give me a huge thumbs up, hit that subscribe button down below, and ring the notification bell to not miss any future uploads and I'll see you all in my next one. Bye!